Okay, it looks like we're going to start two minutes early. Okay, I think we're ready so now. the title of this talk is Taking the Long View, How the Oslo Program Reduces Technical Debt. Um, so just to introduce ourselves first of all, I'm Mark McLaughlin. Um, I guess now I'm, I'm Technical Director for OpenStack at Red Hat. I would have previously been on the, the OpenStack Technical Committee. I was previously PTL of the Oslo Project and I helped start the Oslo Project. Um, and so. I'm here really not as a currently active um, Oslo contributor. I'm here to provide some of the more historical context of how the project started, and, and more Doug is going to provide the more kind of recent view of what's going on these days. All right, and I'm Doug Hellman. I'm an employee at HP. My job title is something like OpenStack contributor. So it's, uh, I work mostly on upstream work. And I'm the current Oslo program uh, technical lead. I'm also a member of the uh, OpenStack Technical Committee. All right. Cool. Yeah. All right. Just to start with explaining, I guess, what the Oslo project is about and what we're trying to achieve. Um, so th this is a mission statement I came up with in, in the early days of, of the project. And so we're trying to produce a set of Python libraries um, containing code shared by the OpenStack projects. So the idea here is, you know, if you look across OpenStack projects, they're all doing quite similar things in, start, in terms of the basic infrastructure of the project. And we're trying to identify that similar code amongst all the projects. And I'm talking about the server projects in, in OpenStack. Identify that shared code and basically move it out into, um, into library projects. That kind of sounds pretty straightforward and obvious, um, and I think. But one of the impediments to doing that is, you know, you can't take you can't take code from projects that weren't wasn't designed to be reused and just put it out there. You have to really um, create a, an, an API around that, a really you know stable, forward-looking API around that. And so the way I talked about that was, you know, we needed the API to be high quality, stable, and um, consistent documented and, and generally applicable. Um, and so the mission of the project is to identify that code that's shared amongst projects and then create this you know, stable API out of, out of that code. Yeah, and I think the, one of the aspects that gets into the technical debt is where we find that projects have slightly different patterns for solving the same problems and trying to meld those things together. And we'll talk a little bit about how we get that done. Absolutely. Yeah. Right, so the, Motivation for the project that we've talked about a little bit um, is not just reducing technical debt, but also providing uh, consistency for deployers so that, uh, for example, we manage the library that deals with configuration files so that each project has the same syntax in the configuration file. You're going to see the same kinds of patterns. You'll see the same names for options in different projects and that sort of thing so that it's more familiar and it's easier to understand the whole OpenStack project. Um, we also want to see consistency from a developer's perspective. So inside the code base of a given application, we want them to be using the same APIs, the same uh, patterns for doing development. Uh, we talk a lot about patterns. and. Uh, that gives you an opportunity as a developer to contribute to multiple projects because you don't have to go and learn a whole separate set of tool base you know, each time you go from project to project. Once you're up to speed on some of the more common tools, you can hop around and, and focus on the application level uh, problems and not um, every tool, you know, every project has a different config library or a different way of doing database access or whatever. Um, and then we want to encourage the development of those patterns because it also encourages new developers to come on, uh, not just to OpenStack as a whole, but to, to be able to make smaller contributions. And we, we talk a lot about our gigantic contributor base. Uh, a lot of those people are bringing one or two patches, fixing one or two problems. But as they see the same pattern over and over again, they, they can start to add features and, and uh, more contributions a, a across the whole project. Yeah, and, and so one thing that's very um, different about Oslo, you know, really, um, it's quite an unusual project in the sense of most OpenStack projects are, you know, they're essentially silos. They're very much focused on a very specific functional area and have a, a community built around those. And so Open Oslo is really one of those few projects where we're trying to, I don't know, whether we're a more responsible project or a more broader thinking project or whatever it is, we're trying to, um, you know, we're trying to 
do things that isn't about a, a specific functional area. We're trying to um, you know, think about the long-term sustainability of OpenStack more generally and kind of um, try and help affect uh, change that really helps operators of the project. Um, so you know, I, I kind of like that we're kind of taking this uh, responsible approach that isn't so much about tactical features in a specific functional area, but just more about the kind of sustainability of the project and usability of the project. Right, a, a longer <laughs> term view. We talk a lot about vertical projects and horizontal projects and documentation and release management and Oslo sort of fit into that horizontal project uh, realm. And uh, so talking a little bit more about that motivation, and the long view that we're trying to take. So I don't know if uh, any of you are familiar with the Long Now Foundation. It's a, a group of people who are, uh, among other things, building a clock that will run and be readable and usable in 10,000 years, which is a pretty audacious sort of thing. And it's, it's inspiring. I don't think that OpenStack is really something that we probably want running in 10,000 years. We probably want to have moved past that by that time. But it gives you the idea of looking past the immediate need and thinking about how can we make OpenStack last 20 years, which is a realistic time frame for a, a project, and uh, sustain not just our current stability, but uh, growth and expansion. Yeah, and, and for me, very personally, like my motivation was very much in this area and a kind of almost a selfish motivation in terms of, you know, I, I, I was getting involved in OpenStack. I was coming from, um, you know, a Red Hat background of working on software that we were going to have to maintain for 10 years um, in terms of Linux. And I knew we were going to get to that with OpenStack eventually. Um, and, you know, looking at the code bases and the technical debt that was accruing, I, I didn't want to be on the hook for maintaining some of this stuff um, in, the, in the very long term. So. A very uh, selfish motivation here almost yeah, as well. Exactly. <laughs> so yeah, that gets into the early days of the project. And I guess when we were preparing this presentation, we just briefly said, we should talk about the early days of the project. But um, you know, I really had to dig into the background to really understood, understand even myself how the, the, the project came to be. Um, I knew I had, there was, I had some awareness that there was the notion of a, a project like Oslo before I even got involved with OpenStack. Um, so what I dug up was that um, in, in, in August 2010, which I guess was almost the month that the month after that OpenStack was originally announced, um, Jay Pipes at that point had already registered an OpenStack common project in Launchpad. Um, when we move on to November 2010, Todd Wiley was starting to try and populate the, 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 that repository with some code. Um, December 2010, Jay, I think, saw that the, the configuration options problem was one of the first things to tackle and uh, added a module there with, a, with an API around that. Um, but things got quiet then until the summer of 2011 um, when Brian Lamar tried to pick up some of the work. Um, and then in October 2011 was my uh, first OpenStack summit. Um, and I remember going along to the OpenStack common session at that summit. And there was a real sense of frustration in the room from the likes of Brian and, and Jay that you know, this is a really important problem. Why is no one working on this problem? Um, and I remember Vish at one point saying, talking again about the, the, the configuration options problem as being one of the harder problems because Glance and Jay was the PTL of, of Glance at this point. Um, Glance had a, a specific approach to configuration options <coughs> using any, any style files. Um, Nova had another approach to configuration options, which was using a file that kind of had, it seems strange to remember it now, but it was a file that had like command line arguments in it, uh, one line each. GNU um, conf library? Or no, it was the G flags. G library. flags, yeah. yeah. Okay. So Vish's point was basically, please don't try and start with the config file <laughs> options problem. It's too contentious. We'll never get agreement on it. And I thought, OK, let's start with that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, And that was our first success story. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so I think yeah. the, the next slide goes into some of that. Yeah. Um, so after that summit session, I guess Jason Kolker created uh, another repository to replace the <laughs> existing OpenStack common repository. I had my um, first prototype of the, the config library that we have now and proposed that and kind of quickly got it included into 
the Nova project, which is quite surprising because it implied a, a change in config file format, um, got Glance to adopt it, and I think then in the Essex release we were you know, starting to say, here's our first success with the OpenStack common project, we have this config um, API. At that point, the code was still actually living in each of the projects, right? So we had a copy of the same code in the, in the Nova repository and the Glance repository. Um, and so we came to the Falsam Summit then, and I organized a, a design summit session there <coughs> where I proposed this notion of managed copy and paste. Um, so what, what I saw going on in the project was similar code being copied and pasted amongst different projects. And I said, OK, as a baby step beyond that, the, the, these, this code doesn't have, you know, good APIs that we can split it out into a library yet, but at least go from this unmanaged copy and paste process we have to a managed copy and paste project process whereby we take some of the code from the projects, put it in a single repository, and have an automated process for copy and pasting it um, between projects. And the idea there was to at least stop the divergence of the, this copy and pasted code. Um, so I think we moved on from there to August 2012, um, when I guess People saw there was momentum around the project, realized that this was a worthwhile project in its own right, needed to be recognized as a separate project, and um, basically recognized that it should have a PTL of its own right. And then... There were enough people involved, there was enough momentum yep. behind yep. it at that point, that it was a real thing. It wasn't just yep. people wishing for it and, to And at that point, the, the unusual thing was, it was the first project really, I think, that was around a code base that wasn't a, a specific functional layer. Right, it wasn't base. a vertical code yeah, base. Exactly, yeah. 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 So. so then in the Grizzly time frame, I was the first PTL. I decided that all of the other projects had a nice funky code name, so I didn't like this project being called OpenStack Common. I called it Oslo. The no notion there was OS to stand for OpenStack, and then Oslo, the Oslo Peace Accord. Not really analogous, but I don't know. Um, I remember you saying something at the summit about let there be peace among all the projects. Yeah, that's, so, that's, yeah that's, seemed that's, like that's a nice trend. sentiment. I went along with that. Yeah, and and frankly, part of the OpenStack Common project is about creating kind of peace between the projects. In the yeah. sense of, in the config option um, case, we had one project with a very opinionated approach and another project with a very opinionated approach, and it appeared at a time that we'd never see all OpenStack projects have the same config file format, which now seems ridiculous. Um, but anyway, just moving on from that there, the, the team grew. We defined our mission statement, which I just talked about. We released the Oslo config library as a standalone library, as opposed to this copy and pasted um, ridiculousness. And we renamed the OpenStack common uh, repository to Oslo incubator to kind of highlight the fact that what was in this OpenStack common repository wasn't, was never going to become a library in its own, but it was more an incubator while we worked on APIs and, and stabilized them. New things would come into being and grow and, and evolve and then be released from there. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And so uh, after the Grizzly Summit, moving into the Havana time frame, um, we well, you worked on releasing Oslo Messaging, which there was a whole pile of RPC-related code, and there were big API changes in that library as it got released. I remember going through several iterations mm -hmm. of that new API. That's been successfully integrated into all of the projects at this point. Yep. Um, and then we also, during Icehouse, uh, well, that was when the uh, adoption happened, and we started evolving some more of our tools that we use for working on the code that we're sharing, and as we uh, grow and do release management and things like that. Um, and then during Juno, uh, this past cycle, we had a major push for graduating libraries. So we t looked at all of the code in the repository, in the incubator repository, very critically decided what code was stable enough and, and had a uh, decent API that was ready to turn into a library. And we created seven new libraries from that. Uh, we also created the liaison program. So OpenStack as a whole has grown enormously since the time that we started doing uh, the, the Oslo work. And 
uh, in the beginning, uh, the Oslo core developers would work on code in the incubator and then take it back to each project and sync each copy in and make sure that it worked. And as we were graduating libraries, we would go and make the changes that the projects needed in order to adopt the library versus using the, the incubated version. Uh, but as the number of projects grew, that just became untenable. And so uh, we, we sort of reversed the responsibility and said that each project needed to provide us with a developer and work with us directly. And that's worked out pretty well. Uh, we had a few bumps, but uh, over the course of Juno, we were able to release seven libraries, and many of them were adopted immediately, and the rest are on track to be adopted during Kilo. So. And what's really impressive about, about, about what Doug has done here um, is like in contrast to the early phases of the project where my attitude was, look, I've done this once with the config um, library. I've, you know, I created the stable API, made a, a library out of it, and I did the work myself of making all of the projects adopt that. Um, you know, and other people would be coming and ask me about when are we going to do this for other projects? And I just expected other people to, to look, just follow my example and do the same thing over again. Um, instead, Doug kind of really created a framework around this project li liaison notion in terms of sharing the responsibility of, of um, projects adopting these libraries, but also really started cracking the whip in terms of, you know, let's, let's really start graduating some of these and let's stop waiting for someone to, to come up and start it's doing them. amazingly <coughs> motivating when you delete code from somebody's repository. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> adoption has really taken off in, in yeah since Doug has taken over in the last year or so. <clears throat> so the, uh, I, I did not do all of that work on my own. There, there, we have a, a small but very devoted team on the uh, Oslo project. It's kind of divided in just as the rest of it. So I look at Oslo as uh, uh, self-similar to the rest of all of OpenStack, right? So we have a horizontal team of core members who are responsible for a bunch of the projects that are managed within Oslo. And then we have some vertical teams that are very focused on managing a specific library. So a couple of examples, um, you know, there, there are four or five of us who help with the release process and get the ball rolling on a new graduation and that sort of thing. And then there are a bunch of people working on Oslo Messaging and Oslo DB and Oslo Config and those sorts of libraries where they don't really worry too much about the release process. They worry about how do I make RPC work with uh, zero MQ versus uh, Rabbit? Or how do I make this particular kind of database? You know, Postgres doesn't quite work exactly the same way as my, uh, MySQL, so I've got to deal with different exception handling cases and things like that. Um, so we have a uh, lot of opportunities for con contributions if you're interested in a particular focus area or if you just are interested in general you know, software engineering kinds of responsibilities. Yeah, and I think, like as you say, there are parallels to, to the generalist versus specialist split in other projects, but I think it's especially marked in Oslo, whereby you know, the generalists care about things like API designs and you know, properly thinking about configuration options. And you know, there's a real broad set of things, really important things to think about in terms in, in Oslo that is very, very general and spread across all of the projects. Um, but you, some of the libraries we have are extremely um, specialized areas in terms of database and messaging, especially. Um, and the, the ability for someone to um, take an interest in that area and go very, very, very deep and be very, very specialized and just focus completely on um, what looks like a small um, library to begin with, but is actually a really complex area. Um, so this, this split between these kind of specialists and, and generalists, I think, is especially marked in, in this project. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so let's talk a little bit about where the code that we get comes from. So you, Mark introduced the idea of taking code out of the projects. Um, we also do create some of our libraries from scratch. So a couple of the examples there. Um, Oslo Sphinx is a documentation theme for developer documentation. So if you go to docs.openstack.org slash developer and look at the documentation for the projects there, uh, that's all themed using a library that's managed by the Oslo team. It's pretty small, has a very fixed API because it's basically plugging into a framework for a documentation tool. Uh, so we just sort of wrote that one from scratch. Um, the packaging library that we use called PBR is another example of that, where we, we're following an API that's defined by somebody else. There was no real need to do an incubation process and, and evolve that API. Um, we also have adopted a couple of libraries that were created independently of OpenStack. Um, the Cliff command line 
framework that's used in the common command line tool and in Neutron's uh, command line tool um, was sort of put together with some requirements that I knew about based on some OpenStack work, but it's actually used outside of OpenStack in some other projects. Uh, Stevedore is another example of that. It manages plugins. So we used to have uh, a, a library or a module in the incubator for importing uh, dynamic code. So it was used for loading drivers and things like that. And Stevedore is a, a more refined, uh, using some standard library tools for that. Um, task flow is used in a couple of different projects now for managing long-running tasks. You can pause tasks and, and rewind things and that sort of thing. And all of these libraries were created um, outside of the Oslo program, and some of them were created outside of OpenStack entirely. And then when they grew to a point where they were sort of big enough and being actually used, and we said, yeah, we'll adopt them, and they'll be official programs. And um, that gives us some benefits, like being able to put them in the gate so we can uh, make sure that changes to um, Stevedore don't break Nova. Um, it also gives us the opportunity to have those contributors be part of the OpenStack community and they're uh, considered active technical contributors and that sort of thing. Yeah, absolutely. So what you see in Oslo in, with these libraries is some of the projects, you can think of them as being quite OpenStack specific in the sense of you really don't see them being used a lot outside of OpenStack, whereas the likes of Stevedore, for example, which Doug created, is extremely general. Um, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a lovely shim layer on, on top of the, uh, the kind of Python pluggable code concept. Um, but I think what we might see over time is some of these libraries that we see right now as being very OpenStack specific, there's a huge amount of scope there to maybe to you know, make some of the OpenStack isms a little bit more optional, maybe drive adoption in, in other projects, um, you know, and some, some level of maybe misconception about how OpenStack specific some of these, these, these libraries are, like the Oslo config library, for example, um, you know, I, I think could be reused in, in plenty of other places. But, Certainly, um, sure. Yeah. Yeah. There's, there's nothing OpenStack specific about that. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and that is definitely something that we think about when we look at code. You know, I, I spoke last year at OpenStack in Action about the amount of code that OpenStack has, and at the time it was, I don't know, some a million something lines of code, and that was an awful lot of code. We could probably shed a lot of that. And so this is one way that we're dealing with that is trying to push it into libraries that are more general purpose than some of the things that are actually OpenStack specific. And so I think we have even seen interest from contributors, plenty of interest from contributors to some of these libraries that, you know, they're really not OpenStack contributors. They, yeah. they have no real interest in OpenStack itself, yeah. um, but see the libraries and find the development process easy enough for them to contribute to. Right. And, yeah. yeah, no, Stevedore is a great yeah. example of that. There's a member of my local Python user group who has no real interest in OpenStack at all, but he's a core reviewer on Stevedore because he has contributed significantly to the documentation and some uh, features and that sort of thing. So when we had our summit in Atlanta, he came to the core reviewer party in Atlanta as a core reviewer because he was available and, and uh, you know, that, that was part of the arrangement. So he's... There you go, work on one of these little libraries and get, invite, right. get invited yeah, to a cool party. Have, yeah. Exactly, <laughs> yeah. That's what OpenStack's all about, right? Mm, parties. Yeah. Mm. OK, so uh, in addition to the code that we have created from scratch and the code that we have adopted from other places, uh, we also have the incubator process um, that you've talked about a little bit already. Yeah. yeah. So Doug has created some nice, uh, a nice pictorial representation, I guess, of what I talked about the year before. So what you can kind of imagine here that between the squares and the, the circles is it's funny, I didn't talk about them in colors because I'm colorblind, so I don't even oh, know what colors Oh, I didn't realize are. that. I'm sorry. Um, no problem. <laughs> <laughs> but so on the left, uh, that's left-hand side, right-hand yeah, side. Yeah, okay, yeah. so on the left-hand side, um, you know, you can think of that as a project, say, like Nova, for example, and it has a bunch of code for doing con configuration options, and on the right-hand side is Glance, and it has a completely different set of code for doing configuration options in a completely different way. So the first step of, next slide, the yeah. first step of, well, what I guess I did with the config options um, work and we do with all of the other similar cases is we're, we're, we're trying to extract the code out, compare kind of the use cases and what they're doing, try and find similar similarities and overlap and, you know, essentially, uh, you know, bring the two of them together into, into code that's going to work for both use cases. Um, but at this point, 
<laughs> you know, you might still not have a perfect, kind of perfectly stable API that you're sure isn't, isn't going to kind of need a lot more work yet. Um, so at this point, the code is now in, in the incubator and is, is copied and pasted um, you know, using an automated pro process into each of the projects. And you can do the work to, to integrate um, this new implementation of that work into, into these projects and kind of make sure the API really does work for those use cases. So then as we take that incubated code and we prepare it for graduation to turn it into a library, um, we found, we've already talked a little bit about some of the problems that we find, but uh, one of the big issues is that uh, that use of the config library throughout the application is pretty, you know, pretty flat, pretty straightforward. But um, if you start having libraries adding options to your default application group, then you, you sort of are mixing and matching purposes. So we try and standardize on naming for groups, for options. We uh, try to make sure that the option names themselves make sense. Uh, we clean up the uh, API so that the options, we don't want the options themselves to be part of the programming interface. So we don't want other parts of the application or other libraries to be poking around in the configuration options of, of a, a new library um, to see how that library might work. We want them to, to pass that stuff in blind. Um, we also try to make the API configuration free because that makes it easier for that new library to be used outside of OpenStack. So every OpenStack application is using our configuration library, but applications outside of OpenStack are not generally using that library. And so we want to provide an API that doesn't require the use of that library if that, that's possible. Um, we also find a lot of cases where uh, a, a module will, because it's been developed in the context of an application, sort of assume some global state that's managed by that application, or it, it, it will update data that's being read in some sort of sneaky way. And so we want to plug all of those holes and make sure that we have a nice, clean API so that if we make changes inside the, the library, we're not going to break applications. And uh, we also try to make that API as small as possible so that um, as we release new versions, we can add things pretty easily, but taking something out of an API requires a long deprecation period, and it requires a lot of changes in applications. And so uh, we want to avoid that as po uh, much as possible. And then, then, of course, we have to give it a good name. Naming yeah. is one of the hard problems in computer science, right? So I, I think one of the more challenging um, graduation processes we've been through is, is the Oslo messaging library, which, which, which I created. So um, in the beginning, the, the messaging code that was created in the, the Nova project um, was a very, very you know, simple shim layer over um, the it wasn't Kombu, it was Carrot, I think was the original oh, messaging really? library. Back, yeah. um, but it was a very small little shim layer over AMQP messaging. Um, the API was all about creating topics and you know you just wrote a dictionary in you know um, onto the message bus and um, you know there was very little hiding of the kind of AMQP concepts there. Um, you know, very little hiding of state in terms of connections. Um, you know, it was a real kind of API that when you worked on the, the code underneath it, you really, you know, re you really felt that any little change at all was going to break the consumers of, of that API. So, you know, before splitting that out into a library, we needed to really make the API contract very, very, very clear um, because one of the goals of um, Oslo messaging was that while the current drivers, while the current implementations of those APIs were AMQP based, um, we wanted to support um, alternative drivers. We wanted to encourage some innovation around the usage of this API, and you know even to add an AMQP driver that didn't use a message bus, for example, and just to make sure we had a very clean API that was ab as abstract as possible to support all the use cases that all in, in the current projects. Um, but you know, so abstract that we could actually support multiple different different concepts. So I wound up taking, you know, code that was very much um, AMQP send a message and message bus type code, and create two different abstractions. One was around RPC servers and clients, and the other one was around kind of notification. Um, senders and receivers. Right. Um, and so that's that you know those abstractions have completely hidden the um 
you know, then the, the, the really kind of messaging technology underneath. So, for example, you could imagine a notification implementation that just sends notifications over HTTP, for example, but doesn't right. implement yeah. the RPC contracts right. constructs. Yeah. And a, a counterexample to that is what we did with the database library, where there's already a nice Python library that gives you a good abstraction from different databases. So we didn't recreate all of that. That's SQL Alchemy. So we built on top of that and are managing the configuration of the database connections, and we're uh, providing some fixtures for use in tests and things like that, and, and managing the, the database migration script. So we're trying to get off of SQL Alchemy Migrate and onto Alembic as a different tool that gives us some more flexibility and that sort of thing. So putting all of that stuff in Oslo.db hides it from the application developer, but we didn't have to recreate all of yeah. the different uh, you know, abstraction layers that we needed for the messaging library. All right, so once we have that uh, code in ready, in a good state, ready to graduate, then we can, oops, we can turn it into a library. Um, is it not animating? Okay, so imagine that the uh, triangles up there get fainter and there are lines between them. There we go, okay, I guess I hit it twice. Um, so, at that point, then, we can turn it into an actual library and follow the usual kinds of code sharing patterns that you expect with a shared library. You, you have uh, releases, you have a stable API, you have contracts about when you're going to deprecate things, that sort of thing. So, You make that sound so trivial, yet we, we actually have quite a bit of debate going on about how to evolve the, the, how we do the releases of the, the libraries, for example. We do, actually. Yeah. We have a couple of different issues with that right so, now. So, so, for example, there's the debate about whether um, you know, we should you know, tie these li the library development cycles with the OpenStack release cycle. So, for example, we'd work on um, new APIs in a library over the, the kind of six-month period, go into feature freeze, and then do a, a release of those, or whether we just actually release these um, libraries kind of as we add a new feature, we add, uh, immediately re release a new version of them. Um, so it's, it's an interesting problem. Yeah, but it, I, I, it's interesting. So during Juno, we used a lot of alpha release numbers. So mm -hmm. we would uh, sort of anticipate what the final release was, but we would release alpha versions leading up to that. Um, and that led to some confusion about whether the library was actually ready for anyone to use or not. And we had some projects that were reluctant to adopt it because it right. seemed to be of alpha quality, uh, where we were really using that tagging as a, uh, uh, a protection against deploying into a continuous deployment environment where uh, something that we, we were not declaring as stable but was ready for development use, uh, we didn't want that to show up if somebody was doing stable de deployments off of, say, the uh, stable uh, Ice House branch or something like that. Um, and then, I don't know, we have a session later this week, I guess tomorrow, to talk about whether or not to continue cool. doing that yeah. based on experiences and, and feedback. Yeah. Um, and then some of the libraries, some of the ones that we adopted in particular, we're going ahead and just releasing those using yeah. regular yeah. version numbers Absolutely. because they, they have a history of doing that. Yeah. So, and they're a little bit further along. Um, okay, so let's, uh, just speaking about what we were, did in Juno, this is what the incubator looked like at the beginning of Juno. Um, each of the little fuzzy gray dots is actually a module name, and there were enough of them that they don't all fit on the slide. The lines are relationships between them, so e those are arrows, and if, if you can tell, there there's some cycles in there, which means that we've got module A imports module B, imports module C, imports module A again, which is not something you can do in a library. It works okay in an application, but it, it's not something you can really do with a bunch of libraries. So that was one of the first things that we had to sort out was breaking all of those relationships up in logical ways that allowed us to turn those things into libraries. Yeah. And that's so, but like I hadn't thought about it this way, but I guess when you were trying to push the graduation cycle of libraries, you're trying to take uh, take elements of this out and figure out a kind of a tree uh, order that you were going to create exactly. libraries out of all of these. Yep, yeah. yep exactly. So th we had to figure out um, not just what the relationships were and create a graph that didn't have any cycles in it, but also based on once we had that graph, what order do we work on this stuff? Because if we start at the top and pick some libraries that are using incubated modules, then we end up copying the incubated modules out into all of those libraries as we release them. So we started working from the bottom up, 
so that we would have, for example, the internationalization library at the very bottom, lots of things import that so they can do translation. Um, it does not really use any of the other tools because it's built on top of some st other standard libraries. Uh, and then we, we worked our way up and we have Oslo Utils and serialization. And around that point, we started finding that we had some code that wasn't being graduated, that was using code that was being graduated, and we started running into some issues within the incubator that led us to change our policy about backwards maintenance and, and things like that. So we had planned to keep modules around in the incubator until projects had had a full cycle to adopt the new library. Uh, but it actually turned out to make adoption more difficult because if a bug was fixed in something that wasn't graduated, uh, it would be possibly importing a graduated version of something that was still in the incubator. Um, so now in, in Kilo, what we're going to do is as soon as we break something out into a library and get the first release, we're going to delete it from the incubator. So it'll still be in the stable branch, but we're not going to maintain it in master, um, which will make adoption easier because you'll continue to be able to sync the other modules that you're using. So the, the colors up here, gray, yellow? Respect. Yeah, OK. So the colors, the yellow uh, ovals are the libraries that we released during Juno. The blue ones were released prior to Juno, so either in Icehouse or prior to Icehouse. Um, that includes uh, a, a late adoption in Icehouse, the Pi CADF library, uh, which is now actually being managed by another program. So the Keystone program took that library over from us. So we, uh, it, it's found a couple of different homes in its lifetime, and we had it for a little while, but it's, it's fitting into the auditing work that they're doing. So um, that's another aspect of what we do. Not every, not every shared library actually has to be owned and managed by the Oslo team, so we help some of the other teams get themselves set up with the right kind of tooling so that they know uh, how to create a new library and, and make good use out of it. OK, so talking about the libraries that we did graduate, um, we, so Oslo Config was the first one uh, or yeah. w way back. Um, Oslo DB was just about ready to graduate in Ice House, but it came out early in Juno. Um, it, got, it was close enough to the summit that we held off uh, because we didn't want to be too disruptive, and there were a couple of issues that we had to, to, to fix. Uh, Oslo Internationalization, I18N, um, came out, that, that's for, uh, as I mentioned, it's for translating user-facing messages, so that includes things that go into the API, error messages, as well as uh, log messages. So we actually have different translation support for different log levels. Um, so if you're in a locale where you um, would like to be able to have your logs in your local language, that's an option, depending on whether the translators have caught up with all of the messages or not. Um, and honestly, I, um, I, I find the, the work we've done on Oslo IDN quite surprising and interesting. I think it's, it's very unusual, actually. I've never seen another open source project which um, you know, really distinguishes its translation efforts between which ones are going to be user facing, which ones are going to end up in log files, um, you know, allows translators to prioritize user facing log messages over or user facing messages over error messages over debug messages um, it's pretty cool stuff and uh, I'd be surprised if it wasn't also useful to, to lots of other projects I'm gonna call you on that one deployers or users to log okay. messages those right. are users too. Yes. okay Good. so but yeah um, I am not aware of anyone else doing anything like that and yeah. when it was first presented to me I thought I don't know that seems a little Odd, but sure, it was, we had enough demand for it, so yeah. we went ahead with it. And we've got some plans in this cycle to add features for dealing with things like plurals and um, context. So I don't know exactly what that is, but uh, you, you can apply context to a translation to give it a little bit more information as it's uh, generated. Yeah, so it's cool stuff. Yeah. Uh, messaging we've talked about is our RPC layer. Uh, Oslo middleware is a set of um, WSGI uh, middleware, which is uh, used for building REST APIs. So WSGI is the Python standard for composing pieces of code together in a stack that makes a, a, a nice uh, HTTP interface. Um, and we've got a, a couple of different uh, WSGI middlewares in that library. Oslo root wrap is uh, basically our wrapper around sudo or a replacement for sudo if you're not using sudo in your uh, production environment. The serialization library, 
uh, was going to include both JSON and XML, but JPipes really hates XML, so we're kind of dropping XML as a project. And so uh, right now it's mostly tools for working with JSON. Oslo Test is an internal tool that's used among the other projects for writing unit tests, and it's got a bunch of fixture support and base classes for making tests easy to, to work with. And then everybody has a utils module. So Oslo Utils is sort of the catch-all where there's a bunch of little things that aren't big enough to be their own library, and they end up there. And we, we try to limit that to things that don't have other dependencies because we don't want somebody who uses Oslo Utils to drag in a bunch of other client libraries for talking to memcache and things like that. So. OK, so one of the other things that we do in the Oslo program, in addition to looking internally at OpenStack code, is we try to look outside of OpenStack and how we interact with the rest of the Python development community and other development communities. Um, we try to uh, not recreate things that already exist. We try to take problems that might appear in some of our applications that can be fixed upstream and help make connections between the application developers and the upstream developers who aren't working on uh, OpenStack. Um, I've talked about adoption, so one of the libraries that we adopted this last cycle is called PyLock file, which is a, a long-lived uh, Python library. The maintainers have basically stopped maintaining it and had been looking for quite a while for somebody to take it over. Uh, we decided that we were using it. We wanted to make some changes and move some of our code into that library, so we've adopted it, and that we'll be making some new releases during the Kilo cycle with some new features added to that library. And it's, it's funny, you talk there about the connections between the OpenStack community and, and the Python community. Doug, I think, would have been the first real Python Easter kind of community person to join OpenStack, I think. I've so I think it's very, very, very appropriate OpenStack. that you're running the Oslo project now. Um, you know, for a community like OpenStack that is, I don't know, how many? 500 developers contributing every month. They're all Python coders. Tiny, tiny, tiny percentage of those people actually have you know, been visible in the Python community before, um, which is an odd, odd situation, but it's really great that you're helping kind of bridge yeah, the and two communities. That, that's changed since I came on board, <laughs> yeah, too. So right. we have a lot more uh, people who uh, attend the Python conferences and other, yeah. other uh, events and have more of a history. So another thing that we deal with is the, uh, the port to Python 3. So if you're not really aware of what this is, Python 3 is, has some syntax changes, and their standard library has rearranged a few things and replaced some APIs. So moving from Python version 2.7 to 3.3 or 3.4 is a non-trivial effort in some cases, and especially for us with some of the dependencies that we have. So uh, we have a couple of members of the Oslo team who are sort of leading up this effort and building some features into our libraries to make that transition easier. Yeah, and, and the key part of this effort, recognizing just how long it's going to take, is to figure out what the baby steps are and figure out how to get people right. interested in contributing towards making those baby steps. Yeah, op OpenStack is like an aircraft carrier. You have to be very careful when you're steering it. Mm -hmm. It does not move quickly. So during Kilo, I talked a little bit about uh, continuing our big push for graduation. Uh, this is a rough estimate of a uh, few of the libraries that I know that we're going to have. So we have Oslo Log, which is our log configuration library. The concurrency library just barely missed the cut for uh, Juno, so we'll be getting that finished up uh, early in Kilo. And then the other one there is illegible. Um, yeah, I can't remember which one that one is. Can you make that out? It's fuzzy from this angle. Don't know, too bad. Uh, cash, maybe? Yeah. Okay. OK, so, and we had a session this morning where we went through all of the code in the incubator that, you know, what was left and talked a little bit about where it might end up living and what needs to happen to it before it can graduate. And so we'll have a couple of other libraries graduating as well. And then I think at the end of Kilo, we'll have some code left in the incubator that is either going to be deprecated and end of life or doesn't really have a lot of adoption, and so we're not convinced that it's stable, and so it'll stay in the incubator for a little while. Um, and then we'll be working mostly on the existing libraries and, cool. and identifying new places and new patterns for uh, bringing more code in. Excellent. So yeah, in terms of, you know, I guess what we're trying to get across here is what the Oslo project is about and, and you know, try and encourage people to, to get involved first and foremost. Um, you know, 
in some ways, it's like any other project, how to get involved. You know, you, you maybe start doing reviews, you start looking for, you know, small, easy places to kind of get involved and start, um, you know, fixing obvious things. I actually talked to a developer last night who, you know, was interested in OpenStack, wanted to start getting involved, um, and I think he tried to run the Oslo Incubator unit tests on his Debian box, and it broke in various places, and he went because it was using Python 3.4 instead of 3.3, and this was his, you know, he found, he, he was delighted because he had found an avenue for him to actually start getting involved and start fixing something and start being useful. Um, so look out for places like that. But, you know, I guess the Oslo project is different in that it is cross-project all of OpenStack. Um, you know, you can work on a library that is very nice and self-contained and, you know, a, a nice kind of area to work on. You have this choice between whether you want to be a generalist in terms of API design and stuff, or whether you want to be a specialist in one of the areas of the libraries. Um, yeah, um, you know, you have anything uh, as small as Oslo Utils that has some string manipulation tools and things like that, which are very, uh, very easy to, to wrap your head around, all the way up to Oslo Messaging, which requires some expertise in dealing with message queues and, and uh, other messaging technologies and that sort of thing. Or if you're interested in databases, there's the database library that's got a lot of active development right now going on. Um, but yeah, there's all sorts of different ways to get involved. And the team is pretty small right now, so interacting with us is easy. We meet on IRC in uh, one of the OpenStack meeting rooms. Uh, I think it's OpenStack Meeting Alt on Mondays at 1600 UTC, so you can join us for our meetings. We'll start doing that the Monday, not the Monday immediately after the summit, but skip a week. And then obviously on the mailing list, if you have any questions about Oslo code, you can uh, tag your subject with the Oslo tag so that the developers are sure to see it. I know that uh, I filter those and, and give them a higher priority for reading because the mailing list volume has gone incredibly high. All right, well, we're four minutes over now, but you know, if anyone had any really burning questions, well, it's four minutes over at the end of the day, so um, anyone got really burning questions, or maybe you can just ask us directly afterwards. No? Okay. Well, thanks for coming. All right, thank you all. Mm.